series of bombings rock cities from New York to Miami. Embassies are attacked. Businesses are destroyed. Cuban Americans are gunned down by assassins. Deep within the U.S. Cuban exile community, a mysterious group emerges to take credit for the violence. A terrorist group known as Omega-7. In the 1970s, the FBI had a working knowledge of anti-Castro terrorists operating in the United States. But then a new group appeared, more violent and aggressive than their predecessors. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. All agents had to go on was a series of chilling phone calls, a mysterious voice, and the threat of more violence. FBI field officers from New York to Miami coordinated their efforts, determined to catch the vicious killers. New York City, the morning of June 6th, 1976, uptown Manhattan. A massive bomb detonates at the Cuban mission to the United Nations. New York police and the FBI rushed to investigate the explosion. I could actually hear the bombs go off from my apartment. Special Agent Larry Wack lives three blocks from the mission. He's on the scene in minutes. The devastation was unbelievable. My first reaction was, there's no way anybody walked away from this thing. And it turned out nobody got injured or hurt. Special Agent Wack examines the entrance of the mission. From the blast pattern, it looks like the bomb exploded directly in front of the door. He notices a security camera mounted overhead. Assuming that the guy walks up and sets it down at the door, he had to be on video. Agent Wack asks a Cuban diplomat for permission to look at the videotape. Told us that uh, we couldn't view it right away and that uh, they would take a look at it and uh, get back to me. Got a call the next day from one of the diplomatic personnel up there uh, who said that there's uh, nothing on the tape. And I said, oh, okay. This is the game we're going to play. It appears that the Cuban officials are keeping the videotaped evidence for their own intelligence, even if it cripples an FBI investigation. It would be nice in a perfect world if they said, look, here's a copy of the tape, and you do what you need to do with it, and, you know, we're going to keep the original, but um, it doesn't happen. A news station provides the FBI with a tape-recorded phone call from a man who claims he belongs to an anti-Castro organization that bombed the Cuban mission, Omega-7. We are Omega-7. Thank you. The FBI has never heard of Omega-7. For Cubans fleeing Fidel Castro's brutal regime, northern New Jersey has become a safe haven. It is home to nearly 100,000 Cuban immigrants. We're uh, trying to get uh, information. FBI agents talk with people in the community in an effort to identify members of Omega-7. Getting information from the Cuban uh, exile community was one of the most difficult things we ever ran across. Even if they knew who the guys were, to them, they're heroes. For the FBI, it's another dead end. Over the next two years, Omega-7 strikes targets in New York City again and again. They bomb the Cuban mission twice. 
Another bomb detonates at Lincoln Center, where an orchestra from Cuba had been performing. In each instance, a representative of Omega 7 calls local news stations to claim responsibility. The terrorist group is on a rampage, but the FBI has few leads. We were coming up with no witnesses. We were coming up with uh, pieces of uh, battery and whatever that wasn't going to pin down anybody. For now, investigators' only solid lead is a mysterious voice claiming responsibility for the violence. To FBI Special Agent Tom Menapace, all the tapes sound like the same person. There were slight variations in tone, but if you listen to them all at the same time, you really picked up kind of a common thread. The caller would identify himself always as a member of uh, Omega 7. Uh, most people pronounced it Omega. Uh, there was a distinct Omega with this guy. It was calm, collected. Here's what we did, here's why we did it. FBI agents in New York and Miami have interviewed dozens of suspected anti-Castro terrorists. But none of the agents recognize this particular voice. The voice was driving us crazy. Nobody's got this voice. We were taking copies of the tapes and playing them with prominent members of the community. And we were basically trying to get a name for that caller. But even those deeply involved in the Cuban community are unable to ID the caller. If there's not that immediate recognition, then a lot of times you get into an area where people are speculating. It's like, gee, it sounds like so-and-so, and, and you kind of know right there that, you know, they're, they're stretching. Yeah, they're locals. Thanks very much for your help. All right, take care. Thank you. Investigators also play the voice for informants they know have connections to various anti-Castro organizations. No one has any idea who the voice belongs to. I don't recognize anyone. And still, the bombings continue. Northern New Jersey, March 1979. Omega-7 bombs the offices of a Cuban businessman in northern New Jersey. His name is Eulalio Negrin an activist who helps reunite Cuban refugees with their families in the United States. At the scene, the FBI finds no witnesses and little evidence. Investigators believe the bomb is only a warning. If they meant to kill Negrin with a bomb, I would think that they would have used a you know, more powerful device and known that he was there or put it on his car or something like that. That fall, more than three years after the original Omega-7 attack, another bomb explodes at the Cuban mission to the UN. The same mysterious voice calls news stations and takes credit on behalf of Omega-7. A month later, the terrorist group abruptly changes its pattern. Eulalio Negrin and his 12-year-old son leave their home. In New Jersey, two masked men attack a businessman for trying to free political prisoners in Cuba. The victim is Eulalio Negrin, a Cuban-American activist. Paramedics try to save his life, but he's lost a lot of blood. In the end, Negrin pays the ultimate price. Tragically, Negrin's 12-year-old son witnessed his father's horrible killing. <laughs> FBI Special Agent Tom Menapace must interview the grief-stricken boy. He was in shock. Basically saw his father get killed. And um, that's pretty horrible. Special Agent Larry Wack is stunned by the brutality of the murder. 
there's a lot of unwritten rules out there in the game of uh, cops and robbers and bad guys. Shooting a man in front of his son is not part of the, the rules. And I found that to be uh, tremendously cold and calculating and began to realize that we were dealing with some pretty callous fellows. Union City Police recover empty brass cartridges believed to be from the shooter's weapon. The FBI and police question area residents. Did you see how many people were inside? You do a real intense neighborhood investigation, essentially tracing the path in which the car was seen fleeing. Investigators finally find a witness who can describe the color, make, and model of the gunman's vehicle. At the Newark FBI office, Special Agent Menapace listens to a news tape in which a voice proudly claims credit for Negrin's murder. The stakes are getting higher. It's gone from being, you know, a bomb in a doorway, you know, endangering people to actually taking a life. A prominent man has been assassinated in front of his own home. But all Agent Menapace has to go on is a vague description of the killer's car. How many of them are registered in Union City or Hudson County or Elizabeth? Who are they registered to? Are any of those registrations people who we have as suspects in the case? In 1979, there was no computerized record system for vehicles by make and model. Investigators failed to find the killer's car. At the autopsy, a pathologist recovers several bullets from the murdered man's body. The bullets could be crucial evidence, but only if investigators can find the murder weapon. A month later, December 1979, the Cuban mission is bombed again. The Soviet mission is also attacked for providing aid to Cuba. The blast seriously injures an NYPD officer. Yet again, the mysterious voice of Omega-7 takes credit for both bombings. Miami, January 1980. A bomb partially destroys a small cigar factory. This is the third bombing in Miami in a year. To the FBI, the pattern is familiar. Special Agent George Kaczynski is a bomb tech with the FBI's Miami field office. There was a tremendous amount of damage done, not just to the building, but to the cigars that were being manufactured there, which are uh, manufactured by hand. As in New York, a representative of Omega-7 calls a local news station to take credit for the bombings. FBI Special Agent Tom Walzer believes the terrorists are trying to intimidate the shop owner who advocates better relations with Cuba. The goal was ultimately to get to the attention of the uh, Cuban community, but it was also to send a message to the individuals and businesses that had dialogue with the Castro regime, as well as to send a message to the island of Cuba itself. In Little Havana, a predominantly Cuban neighborhood in Miami, FBI agents and police continue to dig for clues. We have uh, good access to Cuban leaders, to individuals in the community, as well as uh, established sources that cooperate with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies because the Miami PD has informants, Metro Dade has them, FDLE has them, ATF has them. Despite their wealth of informants, the FBI comes up with nothing solid. Agents compare tape recordings of the Miami bombings with those from New York. They agree that it's the same person. As in New York, investigators play a tape for members of Miami's Cuban community. No one seems to recognize it. 
Manhattan, March 25th, 1980. FBI agents respond to a report that a bomb has been placed on a limousine belonging to the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations. Through interviews, investigators piece together what happened. When the chauffeur got the limo ready to take the ambassador to an appointment, he bumped the car in front of him. He got out to inspect the damage and found a shoebox wrapped in gray duct tape. The chauffeur was suspicious. He was aware that the mission had been bombed repeatedly. He put the box in a garbage can away from the mission and hurried inside to call police. When the NYPD bomb squad arrives, the chauffeur shows them where he put the suspicious device. But the garbage can is now empty. The officers realize the Department of Sanitation has made its regularly scheduled pickup. By now, the truck and the bomb could be anywhere in the city. In New York, a chauffeur finds a possible bomb underneath the limousine of the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations. He places the suspicious device in a trash can and calls the NYPD bomb squad. By the time they arrive, the device has been picked up by a city garbage truck. The bomb squad catches up to the truck. They question the driver, according to FBI Special Agent Tom Menapace. When they first ask him, you know, did you find something, a mechanical device in the trash? He says, no. They're like, it might be a bomb, at which point he's like, it's in the cab. The driver had spotted a radio receiver inside the box. He was planning to take it home. Inside the box is enough C4 explosive to potentially blow up a building. In the lab, an FBI bomb expert examines the device for fingerprints, hairs, and fibers. He finds nothing. Queens, New York, September 11th, 1980. Omega-7 claims another life. The victim is an attache of the Cuban mission to the United Nations. To my knowledge, it was the first assassination of a UN official in the history of the UN on US soil. A newly formed FBI NYPD task force investigates. It's the first joint terrorism task force in FBI history. In the fall of 1980, the FBI gets a break in the case. A former anti-Castro radical contacts Special Agent Larry Wack. He feels innocent people are dying and decides to cooperate. The informant cannot identify the members of Omega-7, but he has heard a rumor about the group. He had learned that there had been a significant split in the actual Omega uh, hierarchy, or as he called it, the board. Anything else? Agent Wack believes that once the FBI has identified suspects, they can exploit the division by pitting one faction against the other. Three months after the murder of the Cuban attaché, a bomb explodes in front of the Cuban consulate in Montreal. At the New York FBI office, the task force wonders if Omega-7 members from the United States are responsible. According to the INS, shortly after the bomb exploded, a car entering the United States refused to stop for inspection. Border guards were unable to get the license plate number. The car was going too fast. But they did get a description of the vehicle. A short time later, a New York state trooper stopped a car matching that description. 
The two men inside the car denied running the border. Without a license plate number or other evidence of guilt, the officer was forced to let them go. But before he did, he wrote down the information from their driver's licenses, including their names, Enrique Erbons and Antonio Casaveres. The task force recognizes Erbon's name. He was known to us as a fanatical, violent exile from Miami. The other gentleman in the car was an unknown entity at that moment, which was interesting to us because the big question was, who is this guy? According to his driver's license, Casaverdes lives in New Jersey. Agent Menapace visits his apartment complex to talk to his neighbors. They tell him Casaveres recently moved to Miami. Menapace plays a tape of the suspect's voice. The neighbors all identify the mysterious man, the voice of Omega-7, as Antonio Casaveres. These people who knew him as a nice young guy, they were shocked that I'm sitting there playing these credit-taking calls for them, and they're recognizing the voice on the tapes as someone they know. It's a huge break in the case. The task force immediately gets a subpoena for Casaveri's phone records and begins to analyze who he has been calling. It's like uh, dropping a pebble in the water the leads go outward because you see who he calls, and then you see who they called. We start to see heavy calling uh, in, in times, in uh, dates leading up to incidents, and then on the day of the incident, no calls. And then after the fact, calls. From the phone records, the FBI identifies three other likely members of Omega-7. They analyze the credit card records of all four suspects. Among the charges are several automobile rentals. The car rentals were really one of the biggest things that really became of interest to us. Agents discover that some of the suspects had rented cars at Newark Airport just before the bombings and could have used them in the crimes. In fact, one man stands out because he had received a parking ticket across the street from the Cuban mission the same day that Omega-7 gunned down the Cuban attache. His name is Eduardo Mazoras. Miami, September 11th, 1981. A bomb explodes at the Mexican consulate. Omega-7 takes credit. Hours later, a second bomb explodes at the Mexican consulate in Manhattan. Once again, Omega-7 claims credit. Although the explosions are over 1,200 miles apart, Agent Menapace believes it's possible that a single person placed both bombs. One person had the time to fly from Florida to New Jersey or New York and carry out the bombings. Agent Menapace rushes to Newark Airport to check the records of rental car agencies. I just was basically working my way down the line, showing the pictures, asking them questions. At the very last rental car company, Menapace learns he's on the right track. The employee looks at the pictures and he says, you just missed this guy. Suspect Eduardo Mazoras had just traded in his rental car for a new one. He claimed that the brakes were bad. I said, well, where's that car that he just brought back? And the guy said, we haven't touched it yet. I said, don't touch it. I said, he has one of your cars now. And the man said, that's correct. Agent Menapace knows it's a huge break. I had the car at the curb that I believe he'd used in the bombings. I had the 
hard suspect in Omega-7, renting the car just before the bombings in New York and a couple hours after the bombings in Florida. Agent Menapace asks investigators to meet him at the rental agency. Time is of the essence. The FBI must stop Omega-7 before the terrorists strike again. explode at Mexican consulates in Miami and New York within hours of each other. The FBI believes Omega-7, an elusive group of Cuban radicals, used rental cars to drop off the bombs. Eduardo Mazoris, one of the FBI's prime suspects, has just returned a car at Newark Airport. Special Agent Tom Menapace calls in a canine unit to inspect the vehicle. dog alerts on the trunk, the indication being that there was a bomb residue in the explosive residue in the trunk of that car. Investigators know that Mazoris has rented another car. When he returns it, agents are waiting for him. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Mazoris is surrounded by FBI agents disguised as customers and rental car employees. But with only circumstantial evidence, they decide to surveil him rather than arrest him. I immediately recognized him. He looked just like his picture. Agent Menapace follows the suspect on a shuttle bus to the terminal. I'm just another traveler waiting for a shuttle bus to, uh, to go to the terminal, and I'm going to stay with him as closely as I can. I'd like to buy a one-way ticket to Miami. Menapace watches as Mazoris gets in line to buy a ticket. and I'm maybe three or four feet behind him. I'm as close to him without burning the surveillance as I can. And what's your name? He uses a false name. He uses the name A. Medina. M-E-D-I-N-A. And he buys a ticket to Miami. As the suspect heads for his gate, Agent Menapace rushes to notify the FBI field office in Miami. In Miami, FBI agents follow the suspect from the airport through the narrow streets of Little Havana and eventually to his house. The Miami field office obtains a warrant to wiretap Mazoris's phone. Special Agent George Kaczynski we monitor 24 hours a day, and it's uh, very consuming. It takes up uh, a lot of man hours and a lot of personnel, and obviously they had to be bilingual. For a year, agents listen to the wiretap, but hear nothing that connects Mazoris with Omega-7. Everything we were doing was basically looking, looking for a thread, looking for that break, looking for that piece of information that was going to get us headed towards to go from theory to reality to, to get to the actors. In the six years since the original Cuban mission bombing, the anti-Castro terrorist organization Omega-7 has spread fear through more than a dozen bombings and two assassinations. The FBI is determined to bring the group to justice. On September 2nd, 1982, at the federal courthouse in New York City, Prosecutors subpoena all Omega-7 suspects to appear before a federal grand jury. The FBI needs their statement on record before the statute of limitations runs out. But they have an ulterior motive. Knowing that Omega-7 is split into two rival factions, the FBI devises a scheme designed to pit one against the other. Agents arrange for the two factions to be in court on the same day. They watch as both groups meet in the hallway. It was evident to me in the courthouse, when we were all there on the same floor, that there was a lot of friction going on between him and them. There was a lot of animosity there. Agents want each faction to worry that the other faction may be cooperating against them. 
it could prompt some of them to make a deal. They certainly knew what they'd done, and they certainly knew who the members of the group were, and the fact that they're all there, and we're all there, is telling them, you know, without coming right out and saying it, the game's over. We're, we're closing the circle on you guys. Most of the suspects assert their Fifth Amendment rights and refuse to testify. Only Eduardo Mazoris takes the stand. He denies everything. But two weeks after the grand jury confrontation, Agent Wack returns to his office to find a message from Eduardo Mazoris. Agent Wack returns the call immediately. He basically said, uh, I want to come up to talk to you. Well, obviously, I'm not about to turn down that offer. So I said, well, when would you like this to be? And he said, well, I'm going to uh, arrive within the next couple of days, and I'll reach out for you then, and we'll arrange to meet. Fine, I'll be waiting for your call. Days later, Agent Wack and an NYPD detective meet Eduardo Mazoras at a hotel in Newark. Heard you got some information for he was very uh, well-groomed, and you think you were sitting there talking to, uh, a, a, you know, a New York City businessman about a deal coming up that was not really a big deal, at least in his eyes. Eduardo Mazoris tells them that he's come to negotiate with the FBI on behalf of Omega-7's leader, Omar. Omar's a little concerned that the FBI is getting close, uh, not just New York, but Miami, Newark, and everybody else that's participating in this thing. Mazzara says he's willing to tell them all about the crimes committed by the other faction, but only if the FBI promises to leave Omar's faction alone. Agent Wack asks to meet Omar in person. Mazzara tells him it's impossible, but he agrees to meet again the next day. Agents suspect that Omar does not exist. Agent Wack fears that he could be Omega-7's next target. The first thing we did was look under uh, the car we were driving, because at that juncture, I had no idea what this guy was up to. Possibly this was some sort of a setup. So we checked the car for a, a, a bomb pretty close when we left. The next day, investigators meet with Eduardo Mazoras for a second time. They confront the suspect about Omar's existence. You're Omar, and you are here to negotiate this whole thing. And he said, yes, you're right. You're Omar. I have been somewhat in charge. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against Investigators read him his Miranda rights. You have the right to talk to an attorney have him present with you up. Mazoris talks about the criminal activities of his rival faction. He started identifying uh, the names of the people who put the bombs down. He initially uh, had, had problems remembering who did what, because they had done so much. The other group. Azores reveals that the rival faction has more than a quarter ton of explosives hidden away for future attacks. He tells investigators he's willing to return to Miami to help them find the explosives. He wanted to put the opposing faction permanently out of business and was hoping that in his own um, mysterious way that he could work a relationship with the FBI and the government that uh, uh, I'll help you get rid of them. I won't do this no more. And leave me alone. Where's the story? But in damning his former comrades, Mazoris reveals that he is Omega-7's primary bomb maker. He is the one who was going to call the shots uh, as to who dies. Um, who gets bombed, how they carry it out. 
I remember thinking to myself that you're so deep. I don't even know if a deal is going to be possible with anything here. The FBI now faces a major dilemma. Mazuris is a confessed terrorist. They can either arrest him or they can take him back to Miami to find the explosives. The decision rises through the ranks of the FBI and the Department of Justice. It went all the way to the director of the FBI, uh, whether we were going to make this trip to Miami. The director of the FBI declares that saving lives is paramount. They should send Eduardo Mazaris back to Miami. We were duty bound to attempt to uh, find those 600 to 800 pounds of uh, uh, high explosives. Um, those explosives could have killed a number of innocent people. We had to take a chance. We had to locate those explosives. Mazaris flies back to Miami. His FBI handlers travel on a separate flight, fearing their presence could jeopardize Mazaris's cover. Mazuris returns to Little Havana with instructions to check in by phone. For four days, the informant contacts the FBI to brief agents on his hunt for the explosives. Then, on the fifth day, Mazuris sounds odd. And he started wavering about uh, whether he could go on with this whole cooperative thing. I didn't like the tone I heard. I had a bad feeling about the call. Agent Wack encourages Mazuris to keep trying and to call him back that afternoon. What's going on? He begins to wonder if the explosives even exist or whether the informant is just manipulating the FBI. The FBI NYPD task force is in a difficult situation. They have released an informant, confessed terrorist Eduardo Mazoris, who claims he can lead them to a quarter ton of explosives. But now agents begin to doubt his intentions. The informant is acting strangely. Special Agent Larry Wack anxiously waits for the informant to call. Hello. He said, uh... I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not coming back. He said, uh, I got to go. And there was a click on the other end of the phone. For the task force, it's a worst case scenario. Special Agent George Kaczynski of the Miami field office now has a terrorist loose in his city. We were devastated. And, uh, and then we had to regroup and say, OK, now we have to find him. Armed with federal warrants, the FBI finds and arrests Mazuris's colleagues. Up this wall, hands on your head. Right hand down. They include Antonio Casaveres, suspected of bombing the Cuban mission in New York City. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used again. FBI agents search for Mazuris in Cuban communities in Miami and throughout the United States. FBI Special Agent Tom Walzer. He was out there as a fugitive on Miami. He had been identified, but he was still in charge of the group. Two weeks later, Special Agent Larry Wack receives an unexpected call. FBI. It's Mazuris. And I was shocked. I was absolutely caught off guard with this phone call. And basically, he starts apologizing for, for taking off. And I think he felt truly bad that he, he ran out on us. And, uh, and, and, and when he said he was sorry, I, I really believe he was. But he was also calling because he was trying to find out, what are you guys going to do with these other guys who did the murders and so on and so forth? And where is that going to leave me? Agent Wack devises a plan to trap the fugitive. Call me at home. He tells Mazuris to call him at home. I gave him my home phone number with uh, instructions that if he had to call again, uh, call collect. Call me later at my home. I didn't want to 
have him in a phone booth calling and all of a sudden run out of uh, quarters and have to hang up. Right. Investigators set up a trap and trace on all calls to Agent Wax home. At the very least, they will find out whether or not Mazoris is still in Miami. Days turn into weeks. There is no word from the fugitive. Then, a month and a half later, Agent Wack receives a call. It's him. I had to have my wife find a neighbor who was uh, awake at 2 in the morning, use their telephone to call the New York FBI office to make notifications down to Miami and to Miami uh, Telephone Company. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Agent Wack tries to keep Mazoris on the phone long enough to trace the call. Okay. Miami FBI agents speed to Little Havana. The call is coming from a payphone. You're talking about uh, having three, four minutes uh, max. So our chances of getting in there on time are very, very difficult. When agents arrive, the fugitive is gone. Hello? Over the next eight months, yeah. Eduardo Mazoris calls right. Agent Wack at home more than a dozen times. All right. No, go ahead. Agents continue their attempts to trap him. On one occasion, we missed him by a matter of minutes where the phone was just dangling off the receiver, hanging down off the, in the phone booth. Agents are frustrated, but remain persistent. They map the location of each payphone Mazoris uses. A pattern emerges. Every call has come from Little Havana. We felt very confident that he was living or working in that area. Investigators decide not to show the fugitive's photo around Little Havana. They fear he will flee to a different city or a different country. The last thing we wanted anybody to do was get word to him that we were zeroing in on an area. That's the last thing we wanted to happen because we didn't want him to leave. If he left, we were in big trouble. Agents do reach out to their most trusted informants in the area, but nobody has seen Eduardo Mazoris. They suspect the terrorist has gone into hiding. Then, on January 12, 1983, bombs explode at two Cuban businesses in Miami. A third bomb is found unexploded. Omar, a.k.a. Eduardo Mazoris, takes credit for the attacks. It was bad enough he's on the run. Now he's bombing again, and, and our first uh, reaction was, my God, if this guy kills anybody, we'll never live with ourselves. Larry Wack. The next night, Agent Wack receives a call. It's Mazoris. The first thing out of my mouth was, uh, did you do that thing last night? And he said, yeah. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to let you guys know I was still around and let the, the other side know I was still around and, and keep the enemy at bay, uh, the enemy being uh, you know, Castro. Wack tries to keep Mazoris on the phone as long as possible. He's worried by what he hears. I could tell he got a lot of enjoyment out of doing it. And that made me very nervous because he was going to get more enjoyment as the days went on if he didn't get caught. The FBI needs a better plan to trap Mazoris before more innocent people are killed. In Miami, an elusive bomber, Eduardo Mazoris, is on the run. After making a series of traced phone calls, the terrorist eludes the FBI's attempts to catch him. Agents must find a way to speed up their response time. In New York City, on July 20th, 1983, they get that chance. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack gets a call in the early morning hours. Larry Wack. It's Mazoris. 
Eddie. Agent Wack's wife notifies the FBI to set the trace in motion. FBI agents in Miami speed toward Little Havana, waiting for word on the caller's exact location. Well, I think uh, you're still willing. There's probably way we Agent go. Wack tries to keep the fugitive on the phone as long as possible. I kept wondering, where is everybody? Where is everybody? Why haven't they gotten him yet? I'm almost running out of things to talk about. Right. All right. Mazaras right. hangs up. The FBI has lost him. Moments later, an agent arrives at the payphone. Mazoris is gone. The agent notices a man resembling Mazoris enter an apartment a block away. FBI Special Agent Tom Walzer. We were very excited but guarded. And, uh... Based on the location where he saw this individual go into, we had our hopes up. The FBI watches the apartment all night, but no one comes out. The next day, agents knock on the landlady's door. They show her a photo of the fugitive and ask if he lives there. She looked at the photo and said, yes, that's it. Right over at the house right there. Rather than provoke a violent confrontation, the agents asked the landlady to call her tenant outside. She knocked on the door and asked uh, for him to come to the door in Spanish. FBI, outside! Outside! He was in complete shock when he saw us, uh, a group of agents armed. He was very surprised, and he was uh, placed under arrest. I'm in the kitchen, guys. Inside the apartment, agents find the tools of the terrorists' deadly trade. He had numerous weapons, silencers, Omega-7 stickers, uh, vests, uh, other paramilitary uh, paraphernalia, um, uh, bomb components. Agents also find remote control devices and half-built timers for setting off bombs. I think that he was preparing to conduct terrorist activities because those timers were at different stages. We felt very gratified that we were able to stop it before anybody got hurt. The federal jury convicts Eduardo Mazaris of bombings, conspiracy, and the murder of the Cuban mission attaché. He is sentenced to life in prison. Other members of Omega-7, already incarcerated, plead guilty to conspiracy to murder a foreign official and conspiracy to bomb property of a foreign government. They are sentenced to 10 years in prison. And I think it sent a message to the exile community that, look, we understand you're anti-Castro and you hate communism as much as most of us, but I got bad news for you, pal. You're not going to bring your methods to our streets. The successful conclusion of the Omega-7 case in the summer of 1983 does send a message. It brings an end to anti-Castro terrorism within the United States. A series of explosions rip through New York City. Sifting through the wreckage in search of one shred of evidence, the FBI and police are desperate for something to lead them to these ruthless terrorists. But the killers are careful to cover their tracks. As the bombings escalate, the FBI is in a deadly race to stop this murderous group with a dangerous cause. In the late 70s and early 80s, 
a legitimate Puerto Rican independence movement took hold in the United States. But a splintered terrorist group known as the FALN was suspected of executing hundreds of bombings in major U.S. cities. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The terrorists were smart, well-organized, and deadly, and went to great lengths to conceal their identities. Agents were determined to shut them down before they hit again. New York City, October 26, 1974, just after midnight. Five explosions rock Manhattan. New York City police officers race to the scenes. The biggest explosion occurs in the financial district. NYPD detective Elmer Toro leads the investigation. One look at the devastation and Toro knows he will be lucky to find any useful evidence. It appears the bombers used dynamite. The problem with bombings is that most of the evidence disappears at the, at the scene. It disappears because uh, how do you trace dynamite? We have no way of tracing uh, dynamite. You, you can hope uh, for a fingerprint here and there. You can hope for a witness. Police question everyone in the area, but no one had seen the bomber. The pattern of debris indicates the bomb was placed under a car. It was put under the engine block and it picked up the car and the engine just flew up in the air. Pieces landed up all the way on the, up on the sixth floor. It was a pretty impressive uh, bombing. We did realize quickly that we had a serious problem in our hands. The only solid clue found at the scene is the tattered remains of what appears to be a leather luggage handle. While police continue to process the scene, they get a call from the Associated Press. One of the alleged bombers called the news agency and told them to look at a phone booth near the bomb site. The patrolman is dispatched to the location. There, under the phone, he finds a letter. He takes it to headquarters to study it for leads. The letter is from a group calling themselves the FALN. In Spanish, the initials stand for the Armed Forces for the National Liberation of Puerto Rico. They are a fringe group with a limited following. The FALN is not even known in Puerto Rico. It's known to the radical, it's known to those fighting for independence, but in general, you speak to the average Puerto Rican, and the FALN is totally unknown to them. The former Spanish colony of Puerto Rico is voluntarily part of the United States. In elections, more than 90% of Puerto Ricans vote to continue to be part of the US, while less than 5% vote for independence. Now that 5% has turned dangerous. In the letter, the FALN demands that the US abandon Puerto Rico or more bombs will explode. These are not people that believe in the electoral system. Their objective is to be violent and to fear cause the people to support them. What began as a bombing investigation is now a terrorist attack. And fighting terrorism is the job of the FBI. The NYPD goes to the Bureau. Detective Toro briefs FBI Special Agent Don Wolford on the evidence found at the bombing locations. The evidence showed that the device was a dynamite-like high explosive, definitely set off by some kind of detonator because that was, that's the only thing that sets off the sticks of dynamite. There were plenty of pieces to show a watch had been used as the timing device and plenty of pieces of a battery showing that the battery had been used to complete the circuit. Pieces of debris shown that this device was in some kind of bag. Several pieces of a handle were found. It's not much to go on, but it's all the investigators have. They try to find out who made the handle. Perhaps they can use the information to learn who bought it. They then turn their attention to the communique. It demands the U.S. abandon Puerto Rico 
and release five Puerto Rican terrorists from federal prison. The terrorists have been in prison since the 1950s. Decades earlier, on November 1st, 1950, two Puerto Rican gunmen try to assassinate President Harry Truman and fail. Two Washington, D.C. policemen are badly injured in the gun battle. One policeman, as well as one of the terrorists, dies. The surviving gunman is sentenced to life in prison. Three years later, four more pro-independence Puerto Ricans are sent to prison after opening fire in the House of Representatives. Now Detective Toro and Agent Wolford theorize friends or family of the five may be behind this new terror group. I was hopeful that working on the background and the current status, maybe, of those five political prisoners would be some kind of lead. So we went behind each of those people. We checked their mailing list. We checked their people who visited them. At the same time, the NYPD and FBI monitor any Puerto Rican activists who have a history of promoting violence. One month after the bombing, the NYPD gets a call about a dead body in an abandoned building in Spanish Harlem. Rookie NYPD officer Angel Poggi, on his first day on the job, goes to investigate. Officer Poggi is of Puerto Rican descent and proud to have become one of New York City's finest. The door was booby-trapped, and he blasted him right across the street and ended his career on the spot. Although Officer Poggi survived the blast, he lost sight in his right eye. When police search the building, they find no dead body. The phone call was a lie to lure police into a deadly trap. The bomb squad recovers explosive residue and another luggage handle. Like the earlier bombing, they determined this bomb was made of dynamite. From the pattern of the blast damage, they suspect it was probably hung on the back of the door, possibly in a garment bag. Through another phone tip, police recover an FALN communique that proudly claims credit for bombing Officer Poggi. For the NYPD, this investigation has become personal. They're fighting for Puerto Rican independence, and the, the first cop they mutilate is a Puerto Rican kid. A Puerto Rican kid, because that's all he was. When they get to your house, you sort of react a little bit different. We knew we had a war in our hands. The communique says the bombing is revenge for the death of an obscure Puerto Rican poet, Martin Tito Perez. If you had put Martin Tito Perez's name out in Spanish Harlem, probably a lot of people might have known who he was. But in the rest of Manhattan and in the rest of the United States, of course, nobody would have known who Martin Tito Perez was, except the bomber knew. At this point, we knew we had a Spanish Harlem connection. A few days earlier, police photographed a Puerto Rican man in Spanish Harlem, handing out leaflets accusing the police of murdering Martin Perez in jail. Although Perez's death was officially ruled a suicide, the activist urges violent revenge against the police. His name is William Morales. William Morales was a very activist person in Spanish Harlem. He was one of the Puerto Rican independence type people who were at any demonstration, any rally or whatever. He was a, a player in the Puerto Rican independence movement. While Morales seems suspicious, police don't have enough to bring him in. They continue their search for anyone who knows anything about the crippling attack on Officer Poggi, but come up empty. While the investigation stalls, the FALN set their sights on a historic tavern in the heart of New York's financial district. The terrorists are raising the stakes for their deadly cause. A terrorist group called the FALN detonates a series of bombs all over New York City. 
the FBI struggles to piece together the evidence in time to stop the bombers before they strike again. They are fighting a losing battle. Historic Francis Tavern in the financial district is a popular lunch spot for Wall Street brokers. January 24th, a bomb explodes during the lunch rush. The blast kills four people and injures more than 60. The victims are rushed to area hospitals. FBI Special Agent Don Wolford. It's one of the worst explosive crime scenes I've seen in uh, my uh, era career. The entire first floor was nothing but splinters. All of the tables and chairs and walls and everything was just splinters. Okay, look up here. The first bombs did not kill anyone. The second targeted a single individual. This time, the bombers clearly intended to kill as many people as possible. This was a midday bomb, not 3 o'clock in the morning, not a bomb hung in a abandoned tenement, but a bomb put in an active restaurant full of people. It is a scene that FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn will never forget. The streets were wet, having been hosed down to hose off the blood and, and uh, damage to the individuals that had been injured or died at the scene. Seeing that scene impacted me in such a way that I really wanted to make sure that we solved those cases. At the site of the blast, investigators again find a luggage handle similar to the one found at the earlier bombings. Independently, witnesses tell them that a few minutes before the bomb exploded, a suspicious man left a garment bag. He's not dressed to be in Francis Tavern restaurant with, with Wall Street brokers at noon. He must have taken a wrong turn. And why is he leaving that bag? Didn't reach down and turn on any switches, according to all the witnesses. He just dropped it. So that bomb was ticking. That thing was going. And based on the damage it did, it probably had 20 to 30 sticks of dynamite in it. So there's a man walking around Manhattan with a bomb with 20 or 30 sticks of dynamite in it. That takes some dedication. And, uh, his hair was part of Witnesses work with a police artist to develop sketches of the suspect. This group was clearly becoming more dangerous, and the FBI intensifies their efforts. Look, I got this sketch on. The FBI distributes the sketch all over New York. But investigators can't find anyone who matches the description. In the lab, technicians review what little physical evidence they have. They turn to the letters left at each of the sites outlining the terrorist group demands. Their objective was to kill executives from U.S. corporations, and they say that right in the communique. Corporate America is seen in those days as part of the military-industrial complex, and as such, attacking U.S. corporations is as good as ta attacking the U.S. government. Right here. Lab technicians confirm that all three FALN communiques use the same paper, typeface, and letterhead. It's not much to go on. We found out, to our chagrin, that the complete communique, the paper, the ink, the font, the type, the stencil, the logo, and everything could be bought at a million different places in Manhattan. I think you already know. The luggage handles do provide lab technicians with a promising lead. The garment bags used to hide the bombs are all one particular model made by one manufacturer. It could be the break the investigators need. The FBI contacts the manufacturer for a list of every store in the New York area that carries the bags. Over the next few weeks, investigators visit each store and show the sketch. But no one seems to recognize the suspect. The bombings continue. Three months after the Francis Tavern bombing, an FALN communique takes credit for four bombs that explode after midnight in midtown Manhattan. Then, 800 miles away in Chicago, the unimaginable happens. Bombs explode at two banks. 
and FALN communique takes credit. The terrorists are now a nationwide threat. In the New York FBI office, investigators compare the Chicago communique with earlier FALN communiques. We know immediately when we get the communique from the masthead being the same, from the logo being the same, that this is in fact our FALN. This gives investigators new angles to pursue. There's a whole new theory that arises from that, and that is that we can't find them in New York because they're really a Chicago-based group. The FBI contacts Special Agent William Dyson in the Chicago field office. This is the first time Chicago is being involved in this group called the FALN. New York has a very large Puerto Rican population and it appeared as though these attacks were going to be strictly in New York. Now Chicago comes new on the scene. So we're really not sure what to do. We're turning to New York saying, do you have any leads? Can you give us a hint? Where do we go? Somehow the FALN must communicate or travel between New York and Chicago. The FBI and police begin rechecking their list of potential suspects. We can look at our New York people and see what kind of Chicago connections they have. Do they travel it to Chicago at all? Do they, in turn, have visitors from Chicago? Is, is the travel the reverse? Are we, do we see Chicago people in New York, and then do we have a bombing? Investigators determined that several of the Puerto Rican activists they had been watching in New York have links to Chicago. We had all of our people that we thought were interested under 24-hour surveillance. And by that, I mean we were sticking with them wherever they went. I would spend weeks and weeks on the street. We just couldn't get to the next level. Their surveillance is not working, and the terror continues. Nine months after the Francis Tavern bombing, bombs again explode in New York. This time, the bombs also tear through the financial centers of Chicago and Washington, D.C. Once again, the FALN takes credit. After the attack, law enforcement in Chicago and corporate security guards respond by searching around their buildings. Outside the corporate headquarters of an oil company, guards discover a suspicious bouquet of flowers linked to FALN and they find 14 roses, high quality roses, like you would give uh, for Mother's Day or something of that nature. Within these roses is this bomb. The Chicago police bomb tech defuses the bomb. Now, for the first time, investigators will have the opportunity to examine an unexploded FALN bomb, which could provide critical leads. A crime lab technician reads the unique identification numbers on the sticks of dynamite. It is traced to a dam project in New Mexico, but the trail stops there. No dynamite was reported stolen. When that lead proves to be a dead end, investigators try to trace the bouquet of roses. We've got to go to the florist. Well, it turns out there's something like 800 florists in the Chicago area. We went to every one of them. When I say we, I mean law enforcement. It wasn't just the FBI. We all got together, and we all divided up all the florist shops, and we went to every one of them. Could not find where those roses came from. Back in New York, the FBI realizes the components of this bomb match the other bombs. Investigators compile lists of all the stores in the New York City area that sell each of the items. They find one store that sells everything. We identify a store up in the Bronx that sells the particular types of watches that have been used, that sells the propane tanks. More importantly, it sells the types of bags that have been used to contain the bombs. The FBI theorizes that maybe the bombers got sloppy and bought everything at the same store. At the store, investigators show the owner the composite sketch. Couldn't say by name who the person was, but that a person similar in appearance to that person had been in this store, definitely buying a whole series of the bags and a whole series of the batteries. Investigators believe this could be a major break. 
they show the store owner photos of possible suspects. She can't positively ID any of them. But she does agree to help. We did solicit the cooperation of the owner of the store. She allowed us to go in and mark discreetly the bags, the watches, those sorts of things, to see whether or not they would be used in a device. These marks might survive the blast and could confirm the items were purchased from her store. Investigators also established round-the-clock surveillance. And when a person uh, bought a bag, we would put a surveillance on that individual and try to identify who this individual was and try to match uh, the composite to the purchaser of the bag. Now the agents will have to wait and see if the terrorists walk into their trap. In New York, a terrorist group called the FALN plants a series of bombs, killing four people and injuring more than 60. Now they've expanded their terror spree to other American cities, including Washington, D.C. and Chicago. The FBI has been struggling to get a lead on the group. They learn that items similar to those used to make the bombs are all sold in a store in the Bronx. Agents set up surveillance. But after months of watching the store, they find nothing. Perhaps the terrorists have already stockpiled supplies. Or perhaps they have spotted their surveillance and are once again one step ahead of investigators. Months after the most recent bombing, the case takes a bizarre twist in Chicago. The police there get an odd tip. An informant reports that a man at a garage has been trying to sell sticks of dynamite to street gangs. The responding officer hears hammering and sees a man trying to break open a trunk. Hey, stand up, put the hammer down now. The officer also put spots dynamite. Put your hands up where I can see him. The, the man says his friend stole it from an apartment that contains even more explosives. The FBI rushes to the apartment. Inside, they find more than a hundred sticks of dynamite and other bomb-making materials. FBI Special Agent William Dyson. So we not only have explosives, but we also have propane tanks. We have a lot of drilled-out wristwatches. We even have communiques. Investigators feel confident they have discovered an FALN bomb factory. We definitely have the FALN. There's no question about it. The problem is, who are the people connected with this apartment? While the bomb squad renders the building safe, investigators question tenants who say no one lives in the apartment. They say they have seen two people going in and out, the building's owner, Carlos Torres, and his wife. One of the things that struck us right away was this lack of sophistication here. The idea of having a bomb factory in your own building. The idea of you being the landlord of the building, the person who would have the access to all the vacant apartments, who would have the keys, just is plain stupid. So now we got two suspects, obviously, because not only do they own the building, but residents say they have access. They've seen them up in this apartment. Investigators search for Carlos Torres, the building's owner, and his wife, Haiti. But they have vanished which reinforces investigators' belief that they have finally identified members of the FALN. The FBI systematically hunts for the bomb factory fugitives. They begin with a thorough background investigation. We pretty much follow the normal fugitive procedures, and that basically is to try to make a biography on each one of these individuals. Who are they? Where did they come from? Who are all their relatives? Make a family tree. We make a family tree on these people better than they would make one. We try to find out every person that's related to them in one way, shape, or form. Agents interview and watch all of their known relatives and friends. But the fugitives have disappeared without a trace. At the same time, the FBI focuses on an odd document found in the bomb factory. 
It seems all the Chicago FALN suspects belong to the same Latino church committee. The Chicago FBI notifies New York. Take it a really close FBI look. Special Agent Rick Hahn. There was a suspicion that the FALN had co-opted this organization, this charitable organization, for its own purposes, to use it for travel, to use it for uh, funding. FBI Special Agent Don Wolford reviews records that show the Chicago suspects used church-paid tickets to fly to New York before several past bombings. There's lots of travel back and forth financed by the organization because ostensibly it is supposed to be lending and giving grants for people to start neighborhood community type Hispanic activities, like uh, Spanish Bibles and hymnals maybe for a church in a, in a Hispanic neighborhood, that kind of thing. Investigators also discovered that the church committee includes a familiar face, New York pro-violence radical William Morales. They keep a close watch on Morales and all the members of the church committee, but investigators don't see anything suspicious. They don't have enough probable cause to request wiretaps or search warrants. We've taken a lot of heat. You know, a lot of people were asking, what are you guys doing? You know, these people keep, keep, keep on blowing up all these, what are you guys doing? Six months later, at the Mobile Oil Building near Grand Central Station, a bomb in an employment office kills one person and injures eight. She came in, she put the umbrella on. The FBI and NYPD arrive and question witnesses. A woman who takes job applications claims she saw the bomber. She was, you know, I know who left that bomb because I saw her and I talked to her and I cannot believe she'd, a little girl, she kept saying, a little girl like that would leave, that, would leave a bomb in here and blow somebody up. But I saw her, and that's who left it. The witness says a woman came in carrying a closed umbrella that seemed unusually heavy. She knew when she hung that device there, when it went off, somebody was going to get hurt. The suspect took a job application. She scratched quick a name and, a, and an address. The bomb is clicking right next to her. She wants to get out of there fast. The suspect tried to leave, but the woman wouldn't let her take the application with her. Minutes later, the bomb went off, decapitating the man next to it. Because he absorbed most of the blast, no one else was killed. I do know that I could recognize her because I saw her. Investigators ask for the application, hoping the suspect left a fingerprint. If they could find a print, it would be their first piece of solid evidence to the identity of the bombers. The lab uncovers nothing on the front of the application. But on the back, they find what they had been looking for, a single fingerprint. The fingerprint belongs to Haiti Torres, the wife of Carlos Torres, who owned the recently discovered FALN bomb factory in Chicago. New York City police issue a warrant for her arrest for second degree murder. After a grand jury indictment, her husband Carlos is added to the FBI's top 10 fugitive list. Now that agents have identified their suspects, they must hope for a break that will uncover where the fugitives are hiding before they strike again. A terror group called the FALN plants bombs in major cities around the country, including New York and Chicago, killing five people and injuring more than 80. In New York, the FBI suspects that William Morales, a pro-violence radical, is somehow connected to the group. But after months of surveillance, investigators haven't seen anything suspicious. The FBI finally asks Morales if he will talk with them. Surprisingly, he agrees. 
FBI Special Agent Don Wolford watches through a one-way mirror as Detective Elmer Toro questions Morales about the FALN terrorist group. But he gives them nothing. Cool, collected, not the least bit uh, upset, not intimidated whatsoever. I don't know nothing about nothing about nothing. Investigators watch for clues to try and determine if it is just an act. My position was, he's a player. He's definitely a player. Maybe he is a minor league player and he doesn't know anything. I don't believe it, but maybe. But he's a player. Investigators continue to suspect Morales. But without more evidence, there are legal limits to how far they can go. Two months later, Queens, New York. Firefighters respond to an explosion in an apartment and find FALN letterhead. FBI agent Wolford arrives just as paramedics take a badly injured man from the apartment. Agent Wolford believes the man may be an FALN suspect and tries to identify him. But the man's face is badly injured and his hands are nearly blown off. Inside the bare apartment, investigators find three small pipe bombs. Evidence suggests a fourth pipe bomb exploded while being built, which explains how the man injured his hands. Investigators discover a copying machine and papers printed with the FALN logo. They also find a large stockpile of explosives. Detective Elmer Toro goes to the hospital to try to identify the suspected bomb maker. The man's hands are so badly injured that police are unable to get fingerprints. Detective Toro tells the man that investigators will learn his identity from evidence at the bomb factory. You can see this. He might as well admit his name now. But the man can't speak. Manuel Rodrigo. I wrote a bunch of names, uh, people that I suspected. Once we got to the name of William Morales, he moved and his, he agreed without saying who he was. But he basically identified himself. Detective Toro believes they may have captured the FALN's bomb maker. Toro grills him for information about the organization. But Morales refuses to cooperate. Nine months later, Morales goes on trial for reckless endangerment and possession of dangerous weapons. Well, Morales didn't fight. Morales claimed a prisoner of war status, no defense, uh, which is a dream for the prosecution. The judge sentences him to 89 years. Police take Morales to the jail ward of Bellevue Hospital to be fitted with artificial hands before going to prison. Incredibly, despite police guards in the hallway, he manages to escape. Investigators rush to Morales' hospital room. My initial reaction was, this is just a bad joke. You know, this is just a bad, yeah, right, sure, sure he's escaped. How could he escape? First off, he's physically unable to escape. And secondly, he's up on the third floor. They find the window bars and mesh cut open. The mesh had been spread apart, not more than six to eight inches, just about like this. So he had to squeeze through that hole and get out of the mesh. And then how did he get down three floors? And of course, coming to mind immediately was he had help. Investigators begin to piece together what happened. Someone must have smuggled in a pair of bolt cutters. William Morales cut himself out from the third floor with his elbows, he just because he had no hands. Investigators believe Morales jumped three floors to the ground, where waiting accomplices drove him away. The FBI and NYPD launch an all-out manhunt for Morales and alert the public and police across the country to be on the lookout. But months go by and the manhunt turns up nothing. Then the terrorists strike again. 
Six months after Morales' escape, the FALN begins bombing again in New York, Chicago, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. One year after William Morales' escape, just north of Chicago, Evanston police respond to reports of an illegally parked van. They radio in the license, which comes back stolen. Police decide to watch the stolen van to see if anyone comes back. So they surveil it. I mean, they could have towed it away, but they surveil it. A short while later, a man and woman drive up to the van and begin loading it. Police, put your hands up! Let me see your hands! Let me see your hands! Turn around! Face away from me! Stay right where Police you are! Police confront the two and find rifles. The suspects have no ID and refuse to speak, leaving police at a loss. Where the weapons come from? They can't even figure out what nationality they are. So they bring him in, so they got those two people. A few hours later, in the same Chicago suburb, a citizen calls Evanston police to complain about a truck parked in a wealthy neighborhood. The woman says people have been coming up to the truck and climbing in the back all morning. A police officer comes out and tries to talk to the driver. How are doing here in the Why are you here? Well, I'm visiting. Who are you visiting? I'm visiting that person over there. Well, who is that person? Well, I don't know his name and all that. And very vague type of descriptions. It all seems very suspicious. You don't know the names at all. The officer glances into the truck and spots the butt of a handgun. Now he knows he's dealing with armed suspects. And there may be more of them hiding in the back of the truck. Step out of the vehicle, sir. Amid a rash of terror bombings, officers in Evanston, Illinois, arrest a suspicious couple. In the back of their truck, police find people with shotguns, handguns, and disguises. Officers arrest them as well. Evanston police photograph and fingerprint their prisoners. No, I've got the list. Can you run it They me? also check their identification, but they run into a problem. The names on their IDs prove to be false. Detectives try to interview the suspects, but they refuse to talk. Sensing they are onto something big, the police call the FBI. FBI Special Agent William Dyson looks at the prisoners and immediately recognizes one as a major FALN terrorist. I've got his wanted poster, top 10 fugitive, and I recognize him. I mean, this is Carlos Torres. Agent Dyson also recognizes other prisoners as members of the FALN. It was like looking at this collage that I had above my desk in the office of all these wanted people. So we have the FALN, we know we have the FALN. We're able to identify enough of them. This is the FALN. The FBI takes a closer look at the false IDs. From past experience, the FBI knows that criminals who use fake ID often include a real address so that it can be used to function in society. Agents notice that several of the IDs have the same Chicago address. FBI and Chicago police raid that address and find bomb-making materials and more FALN evidence. With information from the captured terrorists, agents raid addresses in Milwaukee, New York, and New Jersey. They take down more FALN safe houses. Six years after the bombings began, a federal jury finds the captured FALN terrorists guilty of seditious conspiracy weapons violations, interstate transportation of stolen vehicles, and other charges. But notorious FALN suspected leader William Morales still remains a fugitive. A group of 
just before sentencing, one FALN member decides to cooperate in exchange for a reduced sentence. He says the 11 terrorists were in Evanston to rob an armored car to finance more bombings. He also describes a meeting at a Milwaukee safe house. They had this meeting in which they plot this thing out. And the man leading the meeting, he's got a mask on, so you can't recognize him. But he's got no hands. So immediately, everybody knew it was William Morales. Fanatical FALN leader William Morales's hands were maimed years earlier while making a bomb. Investigators press for more information, but the cooperating FALN member doesn't know how to find Morales. Agents try a different approach and question their informant about how the FALN recruits members. We have to know how they bring new people into the group. Once we know that, then we can go after them. Investigators learned that the FALN recruits from the ranks of Puerto Rican radicals. Anyone who joins must drop all political activities in order to maintain a low profile. With that pattern in mind, FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn searches through hundreds of files on Puerto Rican radicals. It's a long shot attempt to identify the remaining FALN terrorists. We looked for individuals that had stopped attending rallies and things like that, that had made themselves uh, quite well known prior to that time. And we focused on them for surveillances. More than a year passes before the FBI finally finds one suspect who seems to lead a double life. Very, very quickly, we realize this guy's clandestine. He's doing things that's not normal. Agents track the suspect to an FALN safe house. Based on the suspect's behavior, the FBI gets a court order allowing listening devices and wiretaps. In March 1983, two years after first gaining cooperation from the FALN informant, the FBI gets a break. Through a wiretap, they overhear a suspected FALN member on the phone asking a mysterious man in Mexico to come to Chicago. He refused to come up and said, basically, why don't you come visit me? Uh, I'm having plastic surgery done. Uh, I'm in need of uh, good identification. I can't come into the country. Uh, I'll be too easily recognized, that sort of thing. The mysterious man says to call the same number in a week. In a huge break, Investigators identify the mystery voice as that of the FALN's fugitive leader. By his voice, we were pretty sure that it was probably William Morales. It's the first time the FBI has heard Morales' voice since his bold escape from New York police custody four years earlier. The FBI traces terrorist leader William Morales' phone call to a cafe in Puebla, Mexico. Back in Chicago, the FBI is stuck. They have no jurisdiction in Mexico. Agents plan to continue listening to their wiretap and arrest Morales when he makes his plan to come back to America. But since Morales may have had plastic surgery and significantly changed his appearance, agents ask Mexican federales to secretly photograph him. FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn. The federales went down to that coffee shop and found Morales seated at a table there. Morales had severely maimed his hands years earlier while making a bomb. He cannot protect himself or fire a gun. The FBI warns the federales he is probably accompanied by an armed bodyguard, FBI Special Agent Don Wolford. We told him, hey, this guy's got backup, you know, watch it. You just can't walk up with this guy and say, in the car. The federales don't see a bodyguard and decide to make the arrest themselves. NYPD Detective Elmer Toro. They were not supposed to take it down. They were supposed to take photographs. And they decided to make the arrest. And uh, Willie Morales, like a nice trained terrorist, he simply gave up and uh, provided the opportunity for his bodyguard 
to step out of the restaurant the bodyguard opens fire shooting both federales one of them critically the other federale returns fire killing the bodyguard He takes Morales into custody, but his arrest comes at a great price. The wounded Federale dies on the way to the hospital. New York police detective Elmer Toro immediately flies down to Mexico to interview Morales and try to arrange his return. Morales being in police custody and uh, having killed a police officer, I'm sure was subject to some degree of torture by the fe federales down there. Morales greets Detective Toro like a long lost friend. He was happy to see me. And he said to me, uh, and I always remember, he says, uh, Elmer, I want to go back with you. Take me with you. Detective Toro says he'll draw up the papers, and Morales promises to sign. Just take me with you. Okay, with you. Once Mexican police yeah. learn that Morales is going back to the U.S., they treat him better to avoid a possible scandal. Back at his hotel, Detective Toro calls the FBI with the incredible news about Morales. Getting anything done in Mexico is just like, uh, forget it. But now he's talking about, I want to come back. And you know, we're all saying, thank you, Lord. All right. Let him come back. But it's not that simple. All of a sudden, I put the six o'clock news, and there is the bastard denouncing us. Morales appears on TV, flanked by radical lawyers from Cuba, the US, and Mexico. He now angrily condemns America. By this time, he's got a battery of attorneys from all over the place. He had people from Cuba, the attorneys from Cuba, very powerful attorneys. And once he was protected by these attorneys, he didn't need Elmer Toro anymore. He didn't want to come back anymore. Detective Toro now realizes that Morales used him to gain better treatment in jail while waiting for his lawyers to arrive. In the months to come, Cuba uses its influence and money to win the release of Morales. He's on the beach in Cuba, in Cienfuegos, Cuba, I believe. Sooner or later, Fidel Castro's government is going to go, and maybe we'll see Morales at that point. With Morales in permanent exile and other key members in prison, the FALN's eight-year reign of terror comes to an end. The FBI and police, through dedicated investigative work and patient long-term surveillance, have defeated one of the most deadly domestic terror groups in U.S. history.